If you have a Bible this morning, if you turn me to John chapter 15, John chapter 15, we're on page 902. The Bible is under your chairs or around you. If you want to look on there, also it'll be on the screen. This is Joseph Shabazian. I think maybe I'm not pronouncing his last name probably correctly. Joseph is a pastor in Iran. On August 29th, he began serving a 10-year sentence in prison. He was arrested in 2020, and then after trial was then reported, uh, told to report for prison on August the 29th. His charge was forming and operating illegal organizations with the aim of disrupting the security of the country. He pastored a house church of about 30 people, and there was a raid on it. In that raid, two women were arrested for the same charge. They were given six years in prison, and others between one to four years in prison, and some were fined upwards of $15,000. That just happened the other day, his starting jail. This is, I believe I pronounced this right, Zhang Wen Shi. His nickname was Deacon Jang. And um, Jang lived in North Korea, and he lived on the border of North Korea and China. And um, people from North Korea would cross the border into China, which was illegal, but they would come because they needed help. They needed to make money. They needed to get food. They needed to get medical attention, help, medicine. And when they would come, uh, Deacon Chang thought it was basically his um, opportunity as a Christian to practice hospitality. So he opened his home for them. He, he cared for them. He gave them shelter. He gave them clothes and food and, and whatever they needed. And he, and he told them, most importantly, about Jesus. And many people met Jesus in his home. He began to, as, if they stayed longer, he would begin to equip them. He began to tell them how to read the Bible. And him and his pastor, Pastor Han, they would just serve these people faithfully. Well, in November 2014, Chang was kidnapped and brought into North Korea and has been in prison now for 2,871 days. His pastor, Pastor Han, 15 months later, was brutally stabbed to death after being led away from his home. Now, these are just some stories. I had more originally in my notes. Um, after a while, it, it's overwhelming. All these are, there's tons more all over the world. of stories of brothers and sisters in Christ who have been imprisoned or killed for their faith in Jesus. Now you think, and, it, and it's, probably, it's okay to think this. We, don't judge yourselves, be kind to yourselves here. But I've had the thought before, I'm glad I don't live in those places. I'm glad I live here. I mean, we're, we're free to gather today. You're here. No one's going to come in and arrest us. We can talk about Jesus. We can sing. We can pray. We can hang out in the lobby after and encourage each other. That's not illegal here. And we think that kind of stuff doesn't happen in America, right? George Yancey, a professor of sociology at Baylor University, has written a book called So Many Christians, So Few Lions. He's done a study of anti-Christian attitude in the United States. In part of his research, he would send uh, surveys of open-ended questions to different groups. One survey he sent to a group of pro progressive activists in a white, middle-class, educated group. That's who these people were, he, as he describes them. And he basically asked them questions, how do you feel about Christians? How do you feel about your local churches? And these were some of the responses. Kill them all. Let their God sort them out. A torturous death would be too good for them. I'd be a bit giddy, certainly grateful, if everyone who saw him or herself in that category were snatched permanently from our societal peripheries, whether by Holocaust, rapture, or plague. Now, Yancey's findings were that while persecution is not happening in the United States, like in most parts of the world, what is growing is an anti-Christian sentiment and a growing discrimination against Christians in the marketplace. The most prominent place that he found discrimination against Christians was in academia, the university. And professors and teachers and people trying to have an academic career that were Christians, he found that they were discriminated against most of all. Now, if you're new with us, we've been in this series called True North, and we've been studying uh, the Gospel of John. We've been in from chapter 8, and we're going to stop today, and we'll pick up the rest of John's Gospel in the new year and finish at Easter of next year. And we've been studying John's Gospel all year, breaking it up into different series. 
And today, as we finish this part of our study of it, the True North series, we're going to look at what does it mean to follow Jesus when the world hates us? John chapter 15, verse 18. If the world hates you, Jesus says, know that it has hated me before it hated you. Now, before we go any further, you got to talk about what does Jesus mean when he's talking about the world? In uh, the Gospel of John, and in John's three letters, 1, 2, and 3 John, um, in the Scripture, and all throughout the New Testament, the world is used at least three different ways. And it's important that when you're reading it, you know which way it's being talked about. First way the world's talked about is just creation, the created order. God created the world, the earth. And, you know, God created the heavens and the earth, and, and it was good. Another way it's talked about the world is the world of people, races, ethni ethnicities. God so loved the world, the world of people. The third way it's talked about is the mindset of people, or you could even say the culture of people, in active rebellion against God. Theologian David Wells writes this about the world. I think it's a great um, definition of it. The world is the way in which our collective life in our society and the culture that goes with it is organized around the self instead of around God. It is a life characterized by self-righteousness, self-centeredness, self-satisfaction, self-aggrandizement, and self-promotion with a corresponding distaste for the, distaste for the self-denial proper to union with Christ. It is this world that Jesus is talking about. The, the, the world order, the, the culture, the collective life of our society that is in rebellion against God and committed wholeheartedly to the worship of self. This is the world Jesus says, don't be surprised if the world hates you. Which begs the question, why will the world hate us? Why will the world hate us? Two answers from the passage. Number one, the world hates Jesus. The world hates Jesus. Look again at verse 18. If the world hates you, know it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. He said that back in chapter 13 when he washed their feet. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Why, why, why will the world hate us? Because the world hates Jesus, which is mind boggling to me. Why would anyone hate Jesus? I mean, if, especially if you've been with us in our study of the gospel of John, he is so gracious. He is so kind. He meets, you know, um, people caught in sexual sin, and he does not condemn them. He tells them to sin no more, but offers them grace. He meets people that, whose lives have just been wrecked and messed up of their own devices, and he doesn't judge them. He offers them life and living water. He sets people free from demonic bondage. He raises people up from the dead, kids, and gives them back to their parents, a brother, and gives them back to his sister. He, he takes f a little bit of food and just feeds thousands of people. He welcomes children. Children love him. He, he, he's just people that didn't like Jesus, that weren't like him at all. They loved him. They liked him. They wanted to be around him. He was accused of being a friend of sinners. How can you not like Jesus? But if you keep reading the gospels, you realize not everyone liked Jesus. People heard his call. People heard when he said, if you eat, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you can't have any part of me. And they were like, that's, that's weird. We're out. And of course, he's pointing to his sacrificial death and, cons and making that be the, the, the consuming point of your life. People asked him to leave their region after he healed someone. He healed a demoniac. Cast demons out of him. They say they found the man dressed in his right mind at Jesus' feet, the posture of a disciple. And they said, we need you to leave. Please leave our area. People tried to stone him when he would teach. And tried to kill him. And he had to get out of town. See, the thing about Jesus is, he not only exposes our need and offers to fill it, he exposes our sin. Just his, his words and his works expose sin. Look what he continues to say, verse 21. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. 
If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin, but now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. Now, Jesus isn't saying like, oh, these people weren't sinning before I came. He's just saying, now there's no excuse. Before they might have just said, oh, we love God, we're good Jews, we're this, we're that, or whatever. He goes, but now I'm here. And they've heard me, and they've seen my works, and they're without excuse. Their sin is plain before them. That they are, they, they are rejecting the Father, because I am the gift from the Father for the world. And, and there's really not necessarily a cause. He hasn't done anything wrong, or hateful, or ugly, or mean, or horrible. The cause is, they just don't want him. They don't want his light and his life in their life. Now, make no mistake, friends. There are people who respond to the call of Jesus all the time. And he is wonderful to people. But there are still those today who seek to crucify him, who still say, leave our area, leave our home, leave me alone. For some, light draws us in. It's like, wow, it's beautiful and refreshing. And for others, Life repels us. We're like, ah, that's offensive and harsh, and I want no part of it. For some, the scripture says, the gospel of Jesus, the good news about who he is and what he's about, it's a pleasing aroma that leads to life. And for other, it's a foul stench that causes them to recoil back. When we follow Jesus, his light that comes out of our life can bother people. I've met with married couples over the years, and one of them's met Jesus. And the other one's irritated. Why would they be irritated? Now, the spouse sometimes can be irritated. And they can start leaving like, you know, a Bible on their pillow every night. They can be overbearing. But a lot of times, they're not doing that. They're still being the gracious, winsome spouse they were before. The other spouse is just irritated. Well, you're ruining our Sundays now. I've heard people say that. What do you mean I'm ruining your Sunday? I go to church. I come home. I'm here with you all day. They have no reason. They just don't like it. Some bothers them. Friends are bothered when we meet Jesus because light changes the status quo. It shines where it hadn't been before. And this we see all over our world. When people become Christians and begin letting the light of Jesus shine through us, the world doesn't like it. Why does the world hate us? Because the world hates Jesus. The collective order of society in rebellion against God does not want to say that Jesus is the Lord of heaven and earth. They don't want to bow that he's the way, the truth, and the life. They hated him. They will hate us. Second reason is Jesus has called us out of the world. Jesus has called us out of the world. Look again at verse 19. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you're not of the world... But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. When you become a follower of Jesus, it's not like you just said, well, I just checked off a list of a bunch of things I now kind of affirm and say, yeah, I agree with that. And I just go on living my life however I want to. No, to become a follower of Jesus, you are, the scripture says, Jesus says, you're born again. Something's happened to you because of the Holy Spirit. You're called, we're called a new creation. Something's changed. Some supernatural changes happen for us from the inside out. And part of that change is, is we now live basically in a different country. We live in the kingdom of God. We're not just citizens of this world like everyone else. We are citizens of his kingdom. Salvation gives you a new allegiance, a new loyalty, allegiance to Jesus, loyalty to his kingdom, loyalty to his word. And we're now his ambassador wherever we live. We aren't like everyone else. We shouldn't be like everyone else. We have different goals. We have different values. We have different loyalties and perspectives. We're from a different country. And that's why if you really follow Jesus and the way of Jesus, the words of Jesus, your full allegiance is to Jesus, there will be times you find you don't fully fit in. You won't fully fit in at your school. I don't care if you go to a Christian school or not. Public school, Christian school, you find out who the real Christians are at a Christian school when you decide, I'm going to follow Jesus. You'll find times, friends, you just won't fit in. 
You won't fit in on your job all the time. You won't fit in on a team all the time or in your dorm. Not because you're being weird, not because you're being a jerk. That's a whole other issue. Don't be weird. Don't be a jerk, okay? Different sermon. We'll talk about that later. But because you're not of the world. Sometimes this affects your family, and they don't know what to do with you. That has been true about me since I was 16 years old. I have members of my family that they don't know what to do with me. They don't know how to talk to me. They don't know how to interact with me. Some have just stopped. Others are just awkward and weird. And I'm like, you know, yeah, Jesus has changed me, but I'm still me. I still like chicken. I mean, can we still like Thanksgiving? I mean, come on, you know, and let's play dominoes. And it's just like, it's weird. It's just weird. Because we're called to these different things. Like we're called to a different sexual ethic. That makes us at odds with the world. We're called to a sexual ethic in the scripture where we don't have sex with either gender outside of a heterosexual marriage. That's called narrow, uninformed, and even hateful by some people. Now, make no mistake, sometimes people are hateful in the way they say it. But we'll get to that in a minute. People are mocked for their beliefs about this. And they say, well, that's how it is now. That's how it's always been. When I was a senior in high school, I won't tell you the year, but I sure related a lot to the last season of Stranger Things. <laughs> I mean, the 80s were a wild west, friends. I mean, there were no rules. Uh, but I was in a creative writing class in um, my senior year. It, it was the lunchtime period. And this class was just like, the, you know, kind of this hippie guy was teaching it. And there was no rules, easy A, just conversation starters every day. And one day, the conversation was about sex. So everybody was intent, you know, everybody was focused here, you know. And... Um, this one young lady, now this isn't like a bad, you know, the bad girl. This is like the preppy girl, the, 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 from the wealthy, great, clean family girl. I don't know what the word would be called now, but back then, you know, she'd have been like seen as the, the preppy, you know, upper classman girl uh, thing. She said, you know, um, I don't see anything wrong. You, you got to have sex before marriage. So I spoke up and I said, I don't think that's, that has to be the way. In fact, as a follower of Jesus, I'm not going to have sex until I'm married. And she looked at me and said, I'll never forget this. She said, you know, you don't buy a car without taking it for a test drive. Why would I marry someone I've never been to bed with? And, you know, there's nods around the room and all that. And I was 18. I didn't know what to say. So you know those, like, you know, Uncle Rico from uh, Napoleon Dynamite? I mean, don't you wish you could go back? So if I could go back, and join Uncle Rico would make his football play, and I would go back to that creative writing room, and I wish I could say to her, who, who told you that your worth is the same as an automobile? You're, you have way more dignity and honor and glory as an image bearer of God than an automobile. That is why your sexuality is to be prized and honored as a gift from God. Who told you that? The world told her that. And the world keeps telling us that. I know people who have met Jesus, who have transitioned out of a homosexual lifestyle and began to follow him in their sexuality, that have been belittled, treated horribly, mocked, experienced rejection, and even had their lives threatened. If they said they could keep Christ, but they need to go back to being a homosexual or their life is in danger. What is that? It's the world. And we can talk about how behind the world is satanic power, but that's another sermon for another day. We have this different view of marriage. We, we're, we don't think like the world thinks in a marriage. We, de we definitely shouldn't think like Americans think, because Americans think this about marriage. If it gets too hard, there's a way out. But no, and yes, some marriages end horribly, and there's much grace for people. Much grace for many in our church family that have gone through that. But as followers of Jesus, when the marriage gets hard, we don't pull the ejection seat first thing. We work on it. We pray. We, we, we lean in. We, 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 we go after truth together. I mean, the entertainment industry. Speak up about your commitment to Jesus, and you won't make it. Education is the same way. 
I mean, here's the deal. You can be anything in school, television, movies, a government official. We can have a transgender person have reading time for our kids at a local bookstore, and it's okay. We can have a moment of silence to a statue or the universe. We can declare ourselves to have any kind of alternative sexual practice we can. And it's all accepted in the world except for one thing. As long as you obey what one writer calls the ABC rule. Anything but Christ. Anything but Christ. I mean, think about this. When was the last time you watched something in main street, mainstream media? I'm not talking about the Kirk Cameron movies or films with Jesus in it, okay? Mainstream cinema. Netflix, Amazon, maybe you still go to the theaters, you know, you're old school or whatever. And you saw some, a Christian portrayed as a person of integrity, loving, winsome, with character, that they were strong. When was the last time you've seen a Christian portrayed like that? I bet you can't find that. I bet that'd be really hard. And maybe there's one or two, but it seems that in our world, the more anti-God entertainment can be, the more the critics love it. And God's just saying, God says, and Jesus says all throughout the scripture, hey, these things are wicked. He's not trying to be a killjoy. He's trying to save us. He's trying to say, this stuff will kill you. Don't follow it. Our world, consumerism. I mean, when was the last time you ever saw a commercial before what you were about to stream tell you you should get, use your money to bless other people in need? I don't know. Maybe they know my age, but usually it's about medicine, home cleaning projects, or food. But never, hey, there's people in need. You should use your resources to help them. I can't tell you the last time. Because the world just, it, it doesn't promote what we're about. And we're called out of the world. And so the world looks at us and goes, us, oh, what's wrong with you people? They make up stories about us. They hate us. They hated him and they hate us because we we're not a part of this world. We're part of the kingdom of God. We're in it, but we're not supposed to be of it. And the early churches encountered, I mean, the churches encountered hostility since the early church. I mean, just read through the book of Acts. They encounter hostility. The fates of all the apostles. From James, the brother of John, who wrote this gospel, put to death by the sword, executed in Jerusalem. James, the Lord's brother, Jesus' brother, who wrote the letter of James in our New Testament, clubbed to death in the temple. Peter crucified upside down. Bartholomew hacked to pieces. Paul beheaded. You can even go to the place where he was beheaded today. Thomas run through with a spear in India. And John himself died imprisoned. We could go through church history, story after story of Christians in Rome who were thrown into a stadium. Like you would go see the Astros or the Texans, stadiums like that. Christians are put on the field. And what's unleashed? Lions. And the entertainment is to see them to be ripped to shreds. Even to the stories I've told you today and to the growing hostility. Now, how did they face the hostility? And how are we supposed to face the hate toward us? Well, three things I think we see next. And number one is we rely on the Holy Spirit. Look what Jesus says in verse 26. But when the helper comes, this is still tied to it. They're going to hate you. But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. Now, we met the Helper a couple of weeks ago when Jesus talked about him, the Holy Spirit, the legal advocate who God, has, who God sends to apply to us all that Jesus pays for on the cross, the Spirit of truth. It's not an it, it's a who. It's the third person of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God's empowering presence that lives in us and with us, that teaches us, that convicts us, that encourages us, that strengthens us, that gives us words to say, empowers us. This Spirit is with us. And he says, listen, I'm telling you all this stuff, but when the Helper comes, he's at work. Notice he says, he will bear witness about me. That means the Holy Spirit is at work, even in hostile environments. He's in a work wooing and softening hearts. This is why, since the Holy Spirit's at work, we should feel the freedom to keep praying for people, 
to keep praying that God will do something, that the renewal and revival will break out, that people will, all of a sudden, their, the scales will fall from their eyes and they will see the Lord. The eyes of the heart will be open and they will go, yes to Jesus. We don't write anyone off. We don't think, oh, that person, they're too far gone. They're too committed to their lifestyle. They're too committed. They're so hardened against the Lord. They're too far gone. No, no, we rely on the Holy Spirit. Who, if he can save a Pharisee named Saul on his way to kill Christians, can show up and change his life and make him the greatest missionary the world's ever known, he can save that guy. He can save that girl. He can save your friend. The Holy Spirit's at work. We're relying on the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, you're at work. He helps us talk about Jesus. He convicts people of sin. We don't have to convict people of sin. I can't convict you of sin. I can try to guilt you, but guilt doesn't help anyone. Conviction by the Holy Spirit helping you see, this is not what I was made for. This hurts the heart of God. This, will, this dishonors him. It kills me. It harms others. I must turn from this. The Holy Spirit does that. That's what he does. He helps us. He reminds us of everything Jesus has done for us and said to us. Even when, we fear, even when we face hostility, he never leaves us. And since the Holy Spirit's at work, we don't have to fear the culture. We don't have to be afraid of the world. We don't have to fear the hostility. We don't have to fear the government. We can rely on the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, empower me. Holy Spirit, help me. The Holy Spirit is at work right here, right now. He's at work at your workplace. He's at work at your school. He's at work on your street. He's at work in your home. He's at work everywhere. And our lives as followers of Jesus is just saying, Holy Spirit, open my eyes to where you're at work and empower me to join you. You're at work. And I, and I pray where you see places of darkness, Holy Spirit, bring your light there. Holy Spirit, bring your life there. You're the great helper. Come and help. Almost every day, out loud, you can ask my wife if you want verification. I pray this prayer. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. You are welcome in my home, in every room and crevice. You are welcome in my heart to have complete control. You are welcome at our church to have your way. My heart is fully open to you. Have your way with me. How will we handle the growing hostility? We must rely on the Holy Spirit. Before we talk about any kind of strategies or before we talk about, you know, anything else, we stop and we say, no, no, we've been given the helper. Who's at work? What's the Holy Spirit doing? I mean, you read in the book of Acts, when the hostility increased, what did they do? They prayed. Stretch out your hand, Lord and perform miraculous signs and wonders in the name of Jesus, and fill your servants up with great boldness. In Acts 4, they prayed this. We rely on the Holy Spirit. Second thing, we keep telling others about Jesus. Verse 27, Jesus says, You also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. Well, what are we bearing witness about? We're bearing witness about Jesus. We're talking about who he is and what he's done. We're talking about his character. So here's the thing, friends. Jesus says, don't be surprised if the world hates you. Notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, so hate them back. But that's what we do. That's what Americans do. And that's sadly what the church does. Let's just hate them back. Let's march. Let's yell. Let's get in fights. Let's go. Let's vote those people out of office. I don't care which one you want out of office, but let's just, let's take them. Let's be aggressive. Let's take our country back for God. Let's hate them back. You won't find that in the Bible. We don't hate them back. We love them back. Jesus did not come into the world to condemn the world, but to through him, the world might be saved. He loves the world. He loves these people. So we rely on the Holy Spirit and we keep telling them about Jesus, how wonderful he is. We don't have to tell them how awful they are. We tell them how wonderful he is. Now, we don't water down the truth, but we don't tone down the grace. We don't tone down Jesus. We let the Holy Spirit do the convicting. We just do the proclaiming. Jesus is amazing. Jesus is wonderful. Man, he is bringing inside of me a spring of living water that's welling up to an everlasting life. He's the bread of life for the hunger of my soul. He's the resurrection and the life for my dead shame that was on me. He's the way and the truth and the life. He's the vine and I'm the branches. We just keep talking about him. He's amazing. He's wonderful. He is the light that will bring life to your soul. He is what you're looking for. 
He's what you're looking for in every drink from that bottle, every pill you've popped, every weed you smoked. He's, look, he's what you're looking for, every bed you've slept in, every person you've touched. You were looking for Jesus, man. He is what your soul was made for. And he says to all who want to, you can come. That's our message. Not vote them out, get out or anything. Our message is Jesus, either commit or don't clap. Okay? All right? So we don't condemn. We point to Jesus. And that will get a reaction. Some people won't like it. Some people say you're just being bigoted. And you're like, how am I being bigoted? But you got to remember, the God of this age has blinded them in unbelief. You just need to keep proclaiming the light of the glory of the gospel of Christ, 2 Corinthians tells us. The same Jesus that says, if the world hates, don't be surprised if the world hates you. You know what he also says? The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So let's keep asking the Lord the harvest to keep raising up people. I'm going to tell people about Jesus, where I live, work, and play. And make no mistake, Jesus, as Allison Cook writes, Jesus is authoritative, yet always invitational. Jesus never shames, berates, or attacks. He always welcomes. There'll come a day where he will judge the living and the dead, but that's not, our, that's not today, and that's not your role. What's our role? Rely on the Holy Spirit and keep talking about Jesus. What if they fine us? Then they fine us. What if they imprison us? Then they imprison us. What if they kill us? Then we're with him. We can't lose. That's what fueled the early church. Jesus is alive and we can't lose. Kill us and the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Keep us alive and hear our message and his grace will reign and bring transformation. How does that mean? What does that mean for us? We just, we keep telling people about Jesus. The problem is, I don't think we're telling people about Jesus. We got to open up our mouths. We got to start being loving and kind and sacrificial to the people you're actually in relationship with and telling them about him. Those are the people we invite to church. Those are the people we invite next week. Those are the people we tell about Jesus over the holidays, the people in our actual lives and the people that God brings in front of us. And he'll do the confronting. He'll do the convicting. We do the serving. We do the loving. We do the witnessing. This is what we're supposed to do when the world hates us. Rely on the Holy Spirit and keep telling others about Jesus. Third and finally, we are to faithfully keep following Jesus. Faithfully keep following Jesus. Look at chapter 16, verse 1. I've said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues indeed. The hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. But I have said these things to you that when their hour comes, the hour of persecution, you may remember that I told them to you. Look what he says. I've said all these things to you. Back to verse 1. To keep you from falling away. And this is everything he said since chapter 14, verse 1, which, remember, started with, don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Trust in God. Trust also in me. All the things he's been saying, I'm the vine, you're the branches. My peace I give to you, I don't give like the world gives. All the things we've read over those weeks. Why do you say all these things? Why would he even say, don't be surprised if they hate you? To keep us from falling away. And it says there that they'll take us out at these synagogues. Now, he's talking, of course, to Jewish believers. And they think that whoever kills you doing a service to God, to be cast out of the synagogue is like nothing you and I experience today. It would like be branded, I guess, a traitor of the United States, and we are told we can never return to the United States or have any sort of contact with anyone that's from America again, which is probably impossible because of technology and all that kind of stuff. But it's banishment from your community forever, you and all your family which is how you make a living. It it was such an excommunication that some chose death over it because it was such a massive, horrible thing for them. But Jesus is saying, I'm telling you all this so you won't fall away because things might just get hard and people might just say, you know what? This is too hard. I'm still a Christian, but... I'm going to kind of do things differently. Are you, though, friend? If you compromise? 
See, I don't think we should fear the culture. I don't think we should fear the government. I don't think we should fear the world. I don't think we should fear the hostility. I think we should fear the traitor that lives in all of us. That wants to be about self. And say, oh Lord, help me not fall away. Help me not turn from you. Help me not compromise my faith. Help me be faithful in these days to the true message of the gospel and scripture. Not, uh, Lord, true to you above all things. And if something happens to us, we experience hostility. What do we do when we experience hostility? Well, look what Jesus said. Matthew 5, verses 11 through 12. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. What does Jesus say when they actually do are hostile to us? He says, rejoice and be glad. Your reward is in heaven is great. Because remember, this isn't your home. This isn't our country. Yes, we're American citizens. Yes, we live here. Yes, we want God to bless wherever we live and, 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 and all of that. But our true allegiance to the kingdom, our true reward, not the American dream, but a, but a reward from Jesus for being faithful to him in and through hostility. So we have the Holy Spirit. So just a couple of things I just is finishing with is one, have you ever experienced any hostility or pushback for your faith? Any at all? Because it might be worth asking the question, does my life look any different from those around me? I'm not talking about you being weird or being a jerk. I'm talking about you being living unto the Lord faithfully. And if so, you have to remember this verse tells us nothing's wasted on Jesus. You get passed over an opportunity at your work because they know you're a Christian and they're just like, eh, not that guy. He's, she's a little much. He's a little too into his faith and family. And, eh, no. That's not wasted on Jesus. Someone at your school belittles you for your faith or you're excluded from something. That's not wasted. Jesus sees that. He sees it all. He sees every moment of faithfulness. He sees every little thing when your family kind of makes fun of you. Oh, I'm just kidding. But it's a jab. He sees that. Yeah, it may not be as bad as this or as grandiose as we started out with today. But he sees it. Stay faithful. Endure. Rely on the Holy Spirit. Keep talking about Jesus. Lord, help me to keep following you. Help me to not fall away. And what's going to help us really not fall away, friends, is remembering. We're not better than anyone else. The gospel says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans says that before we were Christians, we were enemies of God because we had sin-stained hearts that stiffed arm God. But God in his great love for us, while we were still sinners, made us alive in Jesus. He gave us grace. This Jesus who, while on the cross, looked at his executioners and forgave them on the spot. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He is the Savior who forgives his enemies and makes his enemies his friends. So his friends can now go out and make more enemies friends. Because they are not our enemy. Our enemy is not a flesh and blood. But the powers and principalities in this present darkness. So it is the gospel that reminds me, oh yeah, they're not my enemy. Rely on the Holy Spirit. Keep talking about Jesus and by his grace, keep faithfully following him to the end. To the end. Don't let your heart be troubled. Trust in Jesus. Follow him. He's not troubled. So let's just say, Jesus, I want your untroubled heart to lead and govern mine. Let's pray. Just take a moment with your head bowed and your eyes closed and you just talk to God about what God has talked to you about.
I mean, is there hate in your heart for any group of people in our country? And just repent of that. I'm not talking about you disagree with their values. I'm talking about you hate them. And just repent and say, Lord, help me see people the way you see people. Jesus, show me how to disagree with someone's values but still love the person. Have you been faithfully following Jesus where you live and where you work and study and play? If you haven't, just say, Lord, help me to be faithfully, help me to faithfully follow you. Help my heart be undivided towards you. Help me shine as your light in my neighborhood, in my workplace, at my school. Who's your one? Who's the one person on your heart right now? Man, I need to talk to them about Jesus. I need to invite them to church. I, I, they need to know that I'm their friend, even if we disagree. That I'll, be, I'll be faithful to love them and tell them that Jesus changed my life and he can change theirs too. Who's that one? Pray for them right now. Pray for him by name, Lord, save this person. Use me, Lord. Give me the words. Holy Spirit, I rely on you. Help me. Holy Spirit, soften their heart. Do what Jesus sent you to do. Convict them. Show them who you are, Jesus. Our Father in heaven, these aren't fun words in Scripture, but they're necessary to just reorient us, to remind us, oh, yeah, yeah, don't get too comfortable here. Don't let the world's values take over our hearts. But let our hearts be governed by the values of the kingdom of God. So we as your people today say, help us with that. Sometimes the world looks really good to us. Sometimes they say stuff and we're like, ah, is that right? I don't know. Help us. Help our minds. Help our hearts. Help our allegiances and loyalties be true to you. Fill us with your spirit. We rely upon you. Help us to keep talking about Jesus. And strengthen us to be faithful in these times. We pray this in Jesus' great name. Amen. Would you stand with me? Let's sing this song as a song of response.